afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, attention, Excellencies, Clashos, fellow participants, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a great honor for us to have our mention as the first speaker for the Friday Forum of the first Senior Executive Leadership Program being hosted by the RICS. This Friday Forum is designed to provide the participants or to enlighten the participants on the relevant issues and subject by the eminent speakers. So therefore, we are very confident that our mention with the first speaker, it will portend good moments for the succeeding, succeeding forums. As a household, we need to do a small introduction of the religion for most of the goodness. I know it is not relevant. We know him very well. But for the benefits of our guests from outside and to fulfill the household, I'll, I'll attempt a brief introduction. We all know he is from the district of Ha, Dori Fasa. He is alumnus of the Dr. Graham from Kalengbong and Kangun College. He has his master, uh, he has his, uh, he graduated from the Peace Park University in mechanical engineering and later has uh, done his master's in public administration from the prestigious Harvard University. Lynchin's career in civil service extends from 1991 till 2007. He started as a program officer and later as the officer in charge of the technical and vocational education section and went on to become the first director of the National Technical Training Authority. And before his resignation, he was the director in the Ministry of Labor and Employment. It's very, it's very important, I thought, that uh, we should uh, remind ourselves that our nation was one of the first two citizens who responded to the call of the nation when he left the comfort of the civil service, the uh, bureaucracy, and then uh, jumped into the unknown world of politics. And I'm sure he had done that with the conviction to strengthen the democracy that was being at that time gifted from the throne. He's also the key member who founded the People's Democratic Party and today, he is the president and the prime minister of the People's Democratic Party. He also contested the first ever election, winning to become the leader of the opposition, though it is two in number, smallest. Yet, the number didn't deter our prime minister, then as opposition leader, to confront the government and to raise the issues that are pertinent to the national interest. With his drive and determination as the president of the People's Democratic Party, we know he has uh, fought hard, and today the victory is on his side. He has won the last election, and today at 48, 48, he is one of the youngest prime minister with a lot of energy, drive, dedication, loyalty, patriotism to take this country on the path to peace and prosperity. With this much as an introduction, may I now invite Your Excellency to take the podium. I was uh, amused when I was first being introduced and then as the introduction carried on, I couldn't contain myself. The reason I was amused uh, when my friend Tasho Colonel Tinlet started introducing me is because I know there isn't much to introduce. So uh, he had a challenge in his hands and I wanted to see how he'd handle it. Uh, and I was correct. He didn't have much to introduce. But I started grinning 
I really couldn't contain myself because he made a good thing of a poor situation. Uh, he talked about politics. <laughs> so a good 80% of his introduction about Sering Topge was about Sering Topge, the politician. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but Tasho, thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for your introduction. Tasho's ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply honored to be here today on your Friday Forum as the first speaker of the Friday Forum. I am honored. I don't know if I can justify the responsibility. I don't know if I can justify that honor and fulfill the responsibility. The Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies is an extremely important institution for our nation building. This institute not only trains leaders, not only prepares leaders, but gets Bhutanese leaders on the same page, focuses the attention of our leaders together. The Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies is an institute, is the institute that will take Bhutan into the future. As such, I am deeply honored to have the privilege and the opportunity to share this forum with you. It is His Majesty's it is a reflection of His Majesty's deep concern about Bhutan, about where we stand, about our collective vision as to where we want to go and about how we want to get there. It is a reflection of His Majesty's commitment to net not just leading the nation, but building the nation together with all of us. I'm deeply grateful and respectfully submit our gratitude to His Majesty the King. This week's theme at the Institute has been Bhutan, changes and challenges. Now it goes without saying, it's almost a cliche, it is a cliche, that the only constant is change. We are all subjected to change. What we must consider is whether we have an option. Do nothing and change will lead you. Or do something and you can lead change. I believe that this difference is extremely important. Change may be inevitable. Change may be the only constant. But that said, we have a choice to let change lead us or to actually lead change. If we let change lead us, we have challenges. And hence today's, this week's theme, Bhutan, change and challenges. But if we let, if we have the courage and the wisdom to lead change, we have opportunities. What happens if we don't 
address a crisis before the crisis destroys society. We have change leading, change overcoming an entire society, and it creates a great deal of challenges. Look at the Arab Spring. Think about the Arab Spring. On 16 December 2010, in Tunisia, a young vendor was asked to pay a bribe by policemen. He'd always paid his bribe, and he was always let go. But that day, he didn't have enough money. In fact, just the previous day, he had borrowed 200, the equivalent of 200 US dollars to buy wares for his store, and he didn't have any money. So what did the police do? They took all his wares. After years of oppression, he, he felt at a loss. He didn't know how to confront the situation other than to burn himself to death the next day. The next day after his death, on, 10th, on the 18th of December, 2010, what came to be known as the Arab Spring swept through Tunisia and through the rest of the Arab world. As a result, four governments have been toppled. Four leaders have been disposed. Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, and in Egypt. In Egypt, it has twice. We have Hosni Mubarak and Mohammed Morsi. The region is still unsettled. There's a great deal of anxiety among the people there. It's change change leading people. Closer to home in Nepal, in 1990s, became a democracy, Nepal. Since then, they've had 22 governments in the last 22 years. They've lost the institution of monarchy, become a republic, have the Constituent Assembly scheduled for later this year. After 22 years of democracy, they don't even have a constitution that they can agree on. Change leading people. Bhutan, on the other hand, has been blessed by leaders, by kings who have led change. A fourth king ascended the golden throne at the tender age of 16 in 1972. But even from then, that early age, he started preparing Bhutan for democracy. He started leading change. In 1981, constituted the Songkhak Yarge Sogdu. Ten years after that, the Geok Yarge Sogdes. During that period, train the people to identify leaders, to repose their trust in leaders by electing them, and to hold them accountable. In 1998, His Majesty the Fourth King devolved powers from the throne to an elected council of ministers. Five years after that, the members of the National Assembly, the Chimis, who were electing the ministers were given a choice, so they were forced to select the best among the best. His Majesty the King led the drive to write a constitution of Bhutan, write the constitution of Bhutan. And in 2008, 
we had a first parliamentary elections. By then, we had a constitution in place. By then, we had the institutions of democracy in place. And by then, we had a people, although they were reluctant, although we were reluctant, who were fairly well versed in the processes of democracy. People leading change, creating opportunities. The opportunities we have today is the rule of law, is stability, is peace, and strong institutions. What we want to do with these assets, ladies and gentlemen, is in our hands. That said, we have challenges. Our economy is small. It's extremely small in the international context. At 85 billion nilterms, our entire GDP is barely 1.4 billion US dollars. This is the world's most expensive house in Mumbai, belonging to Mukesh Ambani of Reliance Industries, said to cost anywhere between 1.5 to $2 billion. This building is 27 floors, has nine elevators. I think nine elevators is more elevators than the, they are in the entire kingdom today. Has three helipads. 600 service staff, but it costs anywhere from 1.5 billion to $2 billion, and this is more than our entire GDP. Our economy is weak. It's not just small, it is also weak. That's why we are dealing with the rupee crisis. In spite of the fact that we offloaded 200 million US dollars from our foreign currency reserves, we still have an overdraft of 10 billion rupees. And we have a huge national debt to the tune of 94 billion nilterms. Added to that, because our economy is both small and weak, we have to deal with growing, regardless of what the statistics say, in reality, we are, we are dealing with growing unemployment. If we don't do anything about our situation, change will lead us. And when it does, we are going to find ourselves miserable, overcome with poverty, a huge income divide, unemployment, and I would dare say, lawlessness. Or we can lead change. And today I want to take this opportunity to unveil for the first time in public a project that I've been researching. A project that hopefully we can work together, join hands to lead change and to create opportunities. Ultimately, if we lead change, it is about securing our future. It is about making a stronger Bhutan. It is about self-reliance. It is about national security. This is the project I was referring to, electric vehicles. Think of electric vehicles and what comes to your mind. The small Reva that we see in Timpu, 
It is an electric vehicle, but it's more like a golf cart, actually. But nonetheless, technically, it is an electric vehicle. This, I'm afraid it's not very clear, is also an electric vehicle. This is a vehicle built by Andreas Flockin in 1888. This is the first four-wheel electric vehicle. And these were the days, those were the days when they were way ahead of the combustion engine. In fact, at that time, they didn't have combustion engines. This is the first electric vehicle. There was a time in America when there were more steam-driven engines and electric cars than gasoline cars. Until this came along. Henry Ford with his Model T. In all of the 1900s, at the end of 1999, in December 1999, a competition was conducted to see which car would be the car of the century. They compared all types of cars, and eventually they settled on Henry Ford's Model T. Henry Ford's Model T was also the one that bumped off the development of electric vehicles. They were so successful. Incidentally, the, in the top five cars, the honors went to Model T from America. The other four were from Europe. The Mini, the Citroen, the Beetle, and the Porsche 911. Why did gasoline cars take over? America became connected by highways. Distances became long. Distances are still long. And as all of us know, or think we know, electric cars can't travel far. So electric cars are constrained by their inability to travel long distances. Electricity is not very cheap. Contrary to what we experience in Bhutan, electricity can be quite expensive. And so having an electric car does not necessarily mean it's any cheaper. Nor is it any more friendly for the environment. Many countries pollute the environment heavily while they generate electricity especially those that use oil and coal to generate the electricity. So it's pointless saying I'm saving the environment because I have zero emissions in my electric car if the electricity so generated actually comes from a very polluting source. This is a big one. Political will. Even if politicians actually want to promote electric cars, they cannot mainly because of the oil lobby, but also from the manufacturing lobby, which ensure that things stay the same as far as automobiles are concerned. What about Bhutan? What about Timpu? Distances are short in Timpu. If you think of Timpu, I'm not talking of all of Bhutan. To go from my house in Taba to my office at the Gelyong Sokang is only four kilometers. Taba is in the northern part of Timpu Valley, but if I were to work somewhere around Pabisa, it would still be only another six kilometers, that's 10 kilometers. We don't have the constraints of distance. If electric cars can't take us very far, Timpu is ideal because distances are short. The price of electricity is extremely cheap. At one niltrum, at two niltrum, per unit of electricity, you don't need to spend even five niltrums a day, four niltrums a day, to drive 30 odd kilometers during the day. In Bhutan, we enjoy some of the world's most cheapest electricity. 
It is also some of the world's cleanest because it comes off. It's a run of the river scheme. And therefore, electricity in Bhutan is both cheap and clean. What about political will? Now this is something we have to answer together. But we'll go back to the project of electric fuel vehicles. Can we change Thimpu? Will I drive an electric vehicle? Will cabinet ministers drive electric vehicles? Will parliamentarians drive electric vehicles? And civil servants? And will taxis be converted, convert to electric vehicles? These are some of the benefits. I, I'm, I'm going to fix only with the monetary benefits because this is my primary concern at the moment. A regular taxi, on average, consumes 800 milliliters worth of petrol every day. An electric vehicle taxi that is actually configured to be more powerful and bigger than the uh, regular taxi in Timpu consumes, I've put up there 10 for mathematical purposes, mathematical ease rather, but actually consumes seven nilterms of electricity per day. In a day, if the taxis moved from regular cars to electric cars, they would save 790 nilterms. In a year, sorry, that would translate to saving, earning for the country, because we don't need to import petrol, that would translate to earning 790 nilterms per day. Bhutan has 5,300 odd taxis, of which more than 3,500 are in Thimpu. Assuming 2,000 taxis, only 2,000 taxis make the shift into electric vehicles in the next two years, we would save, we would earn 568 million nilterms a year. But that is only taxis. That does not include the savings in petrol. When all of us, you and I, drive electric vehicles. But why stop at Thimpu? What if we go through Bhutan? Firstly, the small vehicles can come down to Thimpu, from Thimpu to Funsling on one charge. And having reached Funsling, can recharge and go back to Thimpu without any problem. But for those of us who are insecure, we can easily build one charging station. Why one? We can build two charging stations along the way, between Thimpu and Funsling, and between Thimpu and Paro, and Thimpu and Punakha, and Punakha and Tongsa, and so on and so forth. The government can and must build charging stations to encourage its citizens to go electric. But it's not just cars, it's buses and trucks. There's already technology that are driving heavy vehicles in electric. But the most exciting technology is the use of supercapacitors. These are electrical storage devices that can charge quickly, discharge high amounts of power, but they happen to discharge quickly too. Between Timpu, between Funsling and Timpu, as a truck plies upward, after every 10 kilometers, if we have a charging station, one that does not require the truck to stop, only slow down, during which time the truck can extend a connector onto overhead electrical cables, in less than a minute, the truck will be fully charged again. The truck of this type, on an ordinary supercapacitor, 
can travel for about 15 kilometers today. So after every 10 kilometers, if we have a charging station, this is a distinct possibility. We don't need to replace the diesel engine because we cannot put charging stations for trucks all over the place since they are required after every 10 kilometers. The supercapacitor hooked up to the motor will hook up to the transmission in series with the existing diesel engine so that when and if, if and when, you cannot have a charging station, you cannot access a charging station, you can run on the regular diesel engine. And obviously, when you reach Thimpu, to offload your good at, at uh, the destination, you will need to use your diesel engine. The point of all this is we can start saving a tremendous amount of diesel now, not just petrol, by using our indigenous electric power. Let's look at some of the costs, some of the benefits. We pride ourselves as exporting huge amounts of electrical power. In 2012, we exported a little less than 9 billion nil terms worth of electrical power. How much did we import in fuel? 6.8 billion. Just 2.2 billion difference. We blew up whatever we earned from our fast flowing rivers, which generated clean electricity by importing fossil fuel. Of the 6.8 billion, 1.627 billion was purely for electric, uh, sorry, was purely for petrol. Petrol is used almost exclusively for cars. Of the remainder, some of it would go to operate heavy equipment, and especially heavy equipment related to the construction of hydropower. I will not go into there, but suffice it to say, even heavy equipment can be powered by electrical power. But this time, not by battery, but with direct electrical cables. And these devices, these equipment, machines, are much more powerful than the diesel heavy equipment. So we import 6.8 billion nilterms worth of fuel every year, at least last year from India. 6.8 billion rupees were spent to buy the fuel. What if you could half it? What if you could save 3.4 billion rupees? How much would you be willing to spend? Remember, buying electric cars costs money. Assembling electric cars costs money. The R&D required to convert our trucks, to fit them with super capacitors, and to, uh, and to build charging stations every 10 kilometers will cost money. So how much money are we willing to spend to actually save, which actually translates to earn 3.4 billion rupees? Chuka hydropower generated last year 1.7 million units of electricity. Assuming all that electricity was sold to India at two nil terms per unit, we got exactly 3.4 billion. So Chuka earned 3.4 billion. Chuka is 336 megawatts. The rule of thumb is it costs more than 1 million US dollars, that's 60 million nilterms to build one megawatt of power. So at 336, you need 20 billion. 20 billion. I'm hesitating because I think the figure is much larger. It's more than 20 billion, I think. But anyway, if it costs 20 billion nilterms to generate after, after construction, that is after five years, 
3.4 billion rupees, how much money should we as a society, should we as leaders be willing to invest to save 3.4 billion in fossil fuel? Political will is needed. I have five years as a member of the ruling party. And as I urged today's participants, trainees, lecturers, and guests alike, let's join hands. Let's demonstrate that political will is strong in Bhutan. We are blessed with short distances. We are blessed with the world's cheapest and the cleanest energy sources. All that is needed is political will. All that is needed now is the determination to lead change and not be led by it. Back to that image of the electric car, the Reva that you see occasionally in Timpu. To me, really, technically it's an electric car, but it isn't. This is an electric car. It's built by Nissan. It's called the Nissan Leaf. And this man, the one in the suit, Carlos Ghosn, he's the CEO of Nissan Renault. He spent, he invested 4 billion euros to develop the electric car. I'm pictured with Carlos Ghosn because I met him recently. I invited him specifically to talk about electric cars and to seek his guidance and to seek his support. He thinks it's a very good idea. In fact, he thinks it's an extremely good idea because of people like Dr. Tashi Wongchuk. Dr. Tashi Wongchuk is the owner of Thunder Motors. Actually, he's more of a scientist than an entrepreneur. He's been working for the last three years developing electric vehicles in Bhutan assembling them, researching them, and he's developed Thunder Motor. We don't see much of it plying. I've driven his vehicles, in particular the vehicle that is pictured, and I don't see why we are not buying his vehicles. It's a lack of political will. The vehicle that's pictured is a Maruti. His earlier model, he used uh, a vehicle body imported from Malaysia, and uh, it was, it's possible, but he's not satisfied with it. So he got an old Maruti Swift, removed the insides, installed batteries, 30 batteries. By the way, the batteries are all laptop batteries. It is actually laptop batteries that drive electric vehicles. It is the research in computers, and particularly portable computers, that has inadvertently driven the development of electric vehicles. So most top-of-the-line electric vehicles use laptop batteries, lithium-ion laptop batteries. He has about 1,000, well, about 900 of them installed in this particular car. 30 batteries, each of them have laptop batteries inside. If you count the laptop batteries, it'll be more than 900. He has a 10 kilowatt motor, and he designed the program himself. A program is required, a program is the heart of an electric vehicle, because it must tell the battery how much power to provide the motor at any given moment. The program must decide whether the driver is asking for speed or power. If you are going from Timpu to Chunzom, you want speed. If you are going from Timpu to Dochala, you want power. And it is that computer program that will tell how much voltage and current to release from the battery at what time, given the weight of the car and given the ambient temperature. It's quite a complicated piece of work. He's done it, Dr. Dashi Wangchuk, 
and he's done it indigenously. Now, Carlos Ghosn was impressed when we met him and when the two of them met. He's impressed because his vehicle costs about 26 to 35,000 US dollars. Whereas Dr. Tashi Wancho claims he can build his vehicles for under 10,000 US dollars. And so Carlos Ghosn is interested in this technology, technology that is indigenous to Bhutan. Incidentally, for those of you who are interested, his vehicle will be outside. He's not here, he had to go to Punaka, but his vehicle is here. I bought it down with the intention to see firsthand how it performs over long distances. And I am confident because I have driven in it. The idea is to help all of us, not just the government, for all of us to help a person like Dr. Tashi Wangchuk to make an industry of it. We can, for the first time, start assembling our own cars. Not only that, we can start manufacturing them. And given our geographical advantage and brand name, and given that we are marketing an environmentally friendly vehicle, a vehicle that's sustainable, I dare say this could be a good business model. It's in our hands. Do we want to lead change or not? But these vehicles make fantastic taxis. They are bigger than the current taxis, more spacious, more safer, and much, much more cheaper to run. Good for the environment, good for the country, good for the economy. This is a Tesla sedan. I've put it here for two, two reasons. One is Tesla didn't exist before. Tesla, well, unlike Nissan Leaf, which is an offshoot of Nissan, Tesla is a brand new company. It didn't exist. It's a company in Silicon Valley, and they've proven to the world, and to America especially, that electric vehicles uh, can be big, can be fast, and can be extremely attractive. If we exercise enough will, I think the Tesla sedan can replace our hunger for status, our hunger for uh, Prados and Land Cruisers as a status symbol. At 39,000, sorry, at 65,000 US dollars, it comes up to about 39 lakhs, tax-free. So we have, do you want to create opportunities from this? Do we want to lead the change and create opportunities? We have a trade balance, trade imbalance. We need to correct. This particular venture, this particular project would give us an opportunity to create, uh, to, to create more exports and reduce imports. We can create jobs, it's good for the environment, and it is consistent with brand Bhutan. Not only is it consistent with brand Bhutan, but electric vehicles and the ubiquitous use of it will enhance brand Bhutan. So electric vehicles, if we work together, we can package it as an exercise where we lead change in Bhutan. Not just in Bhutan, but this will effectively be leading change in the world. No country in the world has made an all-out effort to go electric. No city in the world has made an all-out effort to go electric. I believe, given our scale, Timpu, Bhutan, we, all of us, have this opportunity to lead the world in going electric. We have 2,000 vehicles 
2,000 electric vehicles come in at the same time or over a year, and you plonk those 2,000 vehicles in Kolkata, who will notice them? Or New York, or Tokyo, or Israel, where they have tried it? Nobody would bat an eyelid. You put 2,000 electric vehicles in Timpu and remove 2,000 existing vehicles, by the way, convert them to electrical vehicles and send them to other parts of the country, those suddenly overnight, Timpu would be seen as a zero emission city. Everywhere you would see electric vehicles. Because of this, the scale, the distance, the electricity, and because of our collective will, we have the opportunity of grabbing the world's attention and investment. We can easily become a hotspot for electric vehicles, and with that, we can easily become the center, the foremost center, the leading center for research and development in the production, in the development and the production of electric vehicles. And like I said earlier, we can also start, if not manufacturing, at least assembling our own electric vehicles, both for domestic consumption and for export to India and to the world. Like the electric vehicles, we have many more challenges, many more opportunities. We can sit back and allow change to overcome us, allow change to lead us, or we can lead change in each of these areas. Agriculture. We are an agrarian nation. We are a nation, or supposed to be a nation of farmers. Yet last year, we imported 14.5 billion, 14.6 billion Niltrum's worth of food. Remember, our entire GDP is just 85 billion Niltrum's. Of that, we imported about 1.2 billion of rice and we imported almost one billion worth of one billion Niltrum's worth of cooking oil. We don't make our own cooking oil. We imported one billion worth of meat. And yet, if we do something about it, if we lead change, we can transform the agricultural landscape. We can enhance productivity overnight, but we need to lead the change. We need to work with the farmers. We need to work with conviction. And whether it is cereals or cooking oil, meat or dairy, and obviously also horticulture, fruit, flowers, we are sitting on a gold mine. If we don't do anything about it, change is going to overcome us. And we are going to be importing more and more food, food for a very hungry nation. If we lead change, we are going to be not just self-sufficient in food, but we will be exporting. And we could be exporting some of the world's premium and best food. Education. On my way in, I was speaking with Tasha Sangizam, the Secretary of Education, and I asked her, how many students are outside? And there are plenty of students outside. Bhutanese students studying outside. There's more than 500 Bhutanese students studying in schools that cost anywhere from 80,000 to 120,000 Niltrums. Assuming that the average price is 100,000 Niltrums per year, these 500 plus students are spending something like 140 million Niltrums a year, most of it in India. 140 million. That does not include travel, clothes, food, rent, what have you. But that's not all. We have about 60, in fact more than 60, 
Bhutanese students studying in international schools outside. These international schools cost anywhere from 12 to 20 lakhs per year. Collectively, they spend about 90 million nil terms a year. This is money going out. This is school education, not college. After 100 years of modern schooling in Bhutan, one would imagine that we would have the experience and the knowledge to educate ourselves, even at the highest levels. Not only educate ourselves, but one would imagine that given the serenity of our country, the peace, the tranquility, the pristine environment, our robust culture, vibrant culture, one would imagine that we'd have hundreds, no thousands of foreigners queuing up to study in Bhutan. But it's the other way around. Tourism, numbers have increased. We need to do more. We need to build more tourism products, make it easier for tourists to enter Bhutan and want to come to Bhutan. Our cottage industry base is extremely weak. We need cottage industries to spread throughout Bhutan to every Zongkhag, to every Geog. Without agriculture, without cottage industries, how can we say that the Bhutanese farmer, Bhutanese farmers' lives are improving. If agriculture is weak, is poor, and cottage industries is absent, how can we say that our lives are improving, at least those of our farmers? And finally, governance. We need to reform the way we conduct government. We need to reform the civil service, we need to allow our civil servants, we need to give them a sense of purpose and allow them to pursue that purpose with a sense of passion. We need to give clearly, clearly, clearly defined targets, not give, but agree on clearly defined targets. And together we must evaluate and make sure that each and every one of our civil servants have the support to deliver on those targets, and at the end of it, are made accountable, whether they've delivered or not. You can lead change, or change can lead you. If change leads you, if change leads us, be prepared for challenges. If we lead change, let's get ready to harvest the opportunities. Let's get ready to work hard. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'll, uh, Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, for the uh, wonderful inaugural Friday Forum Lecture. Uh, now we have uh, 30 minutes uh, for question and answer session. So uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, please raise your hands if you have a question, and we will get the microphone to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, the lady there. Oh, please, uh, the, the mi microphone is. Uh, 
first of all, um, thank you for a wonderful talk and very focused and a very special uh, topic. Um, and congratulations for uh, getting the opportunity to do something special for your country, getting uh, elected. And I'm Maitre uh, from the Gidu College of Business Studies. Um, uh, my question is, uh, of course, related to challenges. Um, we have a lot of students. Um, uh, all of our students, the first thing that they're thinking about is getting a job. So entrepreneurship is a very, very important thing here. But uh, entrepreneurship does not come very easily in any country. It takes time. There have to be several business opportunities. There has to be an entrepreneurial culture. From an agri economy, you have to jump into another kind of an economy. So um, one of the midways, and in fact, I would even say one of the final things is that the entire culture of cooperatives, where the risk is spread, no one individual is uh, taking the risk of entrepreneurship. And uh, this was demonstrated in India through Amol, with which I was associated with the National Dairy Development Board, uh, recreating Amol in some districts, and uh, the sugar cooperatives. So cooperatives for an agri economy are a very, very um, good engine for growth. So what are you doing to promote this? There, I know Bhutan is doing a lot to promote that, but I would like to know in what way will you be doing that? That is one question. Second question is related to that is um, uh, moving from a feudal hierarchical society into a modern society which is integrating into the global economy needs uh, um, a completely different set of institutions and a cultural mindset, which is uh, very difficult to attain. Uh, easier said than done. India is still struggling with it. Um, so. Uh, how are you planning to go about that? These are the two questions. Thank you very much. Ma'am, our culture and traditions are rich and we are very proud of them. So even though we, we have become a modern society, uh, there are certain issues, I suppose, that must evolve, certain elements of our culture that will evolve. That is the definition of culture. But uh, we are not chained by our, cultural, by our culture. We are not chained by our tradition from blossoming in the modern world. In fact, if anything else, our rich culture and heritage, our rich traditions have added depth, had added richness to how we grow as a modern nation state, to how we grow as a modern society in this world. So while your very question is consistent with this week's theme. Basically, how are we going to change? Rather than sit back and do nothing about it and let change overtake you, I am of the opinion that we must harvest from our rich culture and traditions. We must leverage from it even more. We we've always have, but we need to leverage even more so that we as a nation state we as a country, as a kingdom, as a people, in this modern day and age, are successful. One of the successes will be determined by the creation of jobs. And I would like to both agree and disagree that uh, Bhutanese are not entrepreneurial. I would like to agree because that seems to be the proof. Uh, we don't see enough entrepreneurial drive among our school leavers, uh, even among our leaders, among our civil servants. Entrepreneurship is not just about doing business, but still, we don't see that entrepreneurial drive. Yet, on the other hand, you will not find, you will not find people who are 
more entrepreneurial than the Bhutanese. We are extremely smart, extremely calculating, and we know what we are doing. We take good risks, and we know the art of doing business. But there is something missing. And this is something that we leaders, all of us, need to think about. If we Bhutanese are innately entrepreneurial, and I would say we are, look at our villages. Look at our old uh, traders. Look at our parents, our grandparents. My grandfather was a trader. He would take, uh, to put, cut a long story short, I mean, he would carry maize from his village in Shemgang, take it to Tibet, barter it for salt, bring the salt down to lower Shemgang in Panbang area, buy uh, wild cotton, carry bales of wild cotton back to his village in Upper Shemgang, clean it, spin it, weave it, take it to Punakha, sell that for coins, take those coins all the way to Tashigang, buy uh, cows, and then walk with the cows for several weeks back to his village. This is what they did. But like my grandfather, there are Bhutanese who are extremely entrepreneurial. Our job is to foster it. It is to tap into it. And yes, one way is to form cooperatives. And uh, while cooperatives work and must work, one of the problems with cooperatives and the Bhutanese seems to be that we are too entrepreneurial to allow the cooperative system to work. But yes, we need to do a lot. In the agricultural sector, we must nurture cooperatives. We must discipline the entrepreneurial zeal and spirit within us and, 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 and develop many more cooperatives because only through cooperatives, actually, while on the one hand, cooperatives allow uh, money-making, job creation, combined entrepreneurship, on the other hand, that's the only way we can meet the scale of the goods that are required, whether it is bars of soap or whether it is asparagus or honey, buckwheat, any agricultural produce, if we have cooperatives, then we have a better chance of meeting the demand and a small chance of making a dent in the market in Timpu and in the neighboring countries. Please raise your hands. Uh, please, Lai, any more question? Uh, while it's an wonderful opportunity to be listening to a great lecture by His Excellency, uh, RICS is also about uh, discourse. RICS is about uh, uh, challenging. RICS is about arguing, all in the interest of nation building, all in the interest of taking our country forward. So please do ask questions. This is a wonderful opportunity. Yes, sir. And uh, also, please introduce yourself uh, briefly. Thank you so much, uh, His Excellency. My name is Subhadan Rai, and I'm, from, uh, I'm a student from Gedu College of Business Study. Now, with this uh, Friday forum, what it made me is that it is an alarm clock for me to wake up, because uh, the change uh, Particularly, it talks about the, uh, the business, the initiative of uh, entrepreneur. So as I'm a business student, I do have a concern that we must uh, lead the change in our country. So my question is that we have uh, so many models in our college that we need to uh, do, we need to study that. In that model, what we used to do is that we plan the business. We do so many research. 
But in that research, sometimes we find so many, uh, so many uh, like wrong information, like a shortage of information from different organizations. And then when we go on studying what is the main cause, we used to find that there are so many uh, re restrictions from the government side that it may not be, uh, that if we don't fulfill, uh, fulfill some of the point, the business may not be success. So in that case, uh, uh, if uh, His Excellency would uh, share some points about the, uh, the issues that the government had or uh, that the private sectors are not willing to give some of the information, I would be really thankful. Thank you so much. Thank you, La. And uh, I want to congratulate you on your hard work. Your observation is indicative of the fact that you have worked very hard. And I want to apologize to you. I want to apologize for making your work unnecessarily difficult. But you've put your finger right on the spot. We don't have information. We don't seem to respect information. We do studies all the time. We commission studies. We have consultants. But we don't do anything with that information. At the very minimum, we should be able to share it with our students, with our schools and with our colleges. And it's not that the government is afraid. It's just that we can't care any less. We don't really care. Now, if we are afraid of what you're going to do with the information, or if we are afraid, we don't know whether this information about rural water supply is classified or not, then I suppose we can be excused. But we couldn't care less. And this is a tragedy. And this cannot go on. Whether we are in the civil service, whether we are politicians, whether we are uh, businessmen or women, we must care. We must care for our country. We must ensure that we put in our own quota of sweat for nation building. Most of us didn't put in any blood. Let's put in some sweat and tears for our country. But for that, we have to be a little concerned. We have to be worried. And when we have information, we must use that information and we must use it publicly and make it available publicly so that the very purpose of generating that information is at least, at least we try to achieve that very purpose of generating that information. But when students come to us for the purposes of research, there, there is absolutely no excuse because as leaders, we must be role models. We must be nurturing their leadership potential, not suffocating it. So while I congratulate you on the hard work that you've been doing, I don't know in what area of research, but I will apologize to you sincerely for the runaround that you've been given and for making it so difficult for you to access your own government's information. I've thought about this, but not this powerfully as, as you have just now reminded me. So I will commit to doing something about this. We will need to interface, the government will need to interface with our colleges a lot more clearly and a lot more systematically. And we need to provide our college boys and girls, our students, our future, with the resources, in your case, to become a successful entrepreneur. OK? Jabkachi do. Jesus. 
My name is Doji Dabu. I'm working in Dongsan Swimming Corporation Limited, Nanglam. Your Excellency, I thank you a lot for your presentation and I'm highly enlightened. Thank you, sir. Uh, my, the person, that Dr. Tashi, whoever is in, invented battery car out of a laptop battery, I congratulate him. But I have, a, I have a notion that how viable or how sustainable it will be now that the Chinese are producing buses with battery cars and they're going as far as 80 kilometers. So the question of sustainability, Your Excellency, that's one. Number two, to substantiate uh, your, uh, your Excellency's regarding the vehicles being run on battery, the heavy duty vehicles to run on battery, when it's getting exhausted, it goes through a wire for recharging at a low speed. I have a weird, it may, be, it may sound weird, but uh, we can have, we can have uh, electric wires all along the road from here to Thimphu, maybe two or three wires, and all heavy duty vehicles will have the electricity tapping and it can run on this just like the electric trains are run. And in mining, in most of the bigger mines, heavy duty dump trucks carrying more than 70 tons are worked in this way. So I have a, they submitted to Lin Chen for your view, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Doji. The buses that are operating in China are very successful, but they also run for very short distances, and they also use supercapacitors. And if you look it up in Google, you will see the picture of the buses being charged where they pick up and drop passengers. So every five kilometers, the bus from the top, uh, a lever comes up and makes contact with overhead cables. It's the same technology. Should we abstain from doing research and development because another country is uh, proving to be successful? No, not if we want to be in the competition. Not if we want to actually stay ahead of the game. Because this game is designed for Bhutan. Again, distances are short. The cost of electricity is extremely low. It's almost at a throwaway price and electricity generated is clean. Electric vehicles are designed for Bhutan, not for China. Yes, they may put in a lot of R&D and eventually come up with something that is very viable there. But until that time, and even if that happens, we will reap the benefits of their research. But that does not mean we shouldn't do our own research. We can become world leaders by our own right, in our own right. We can develop cars, assemble cars, fabricate cars, manufacture cars for the domestic market and also internationally. It's up to us leaders, it's up to us whether we have the courage to go there. It's up to us whether we want to half the import of fossil fuel from 6.8 billion a year to 3.4 billion a year in a few years. It's up to us whether by lowering the dependence, our dependence on fossil fuel and lowering the emission of polluting gases, we want to save our environment. And in so doing, save our watershed. And in so doing, generate more water for the, our rivers which in turn will generate even more electricity through our hydropower plants. I am of the belief that if we make a concerted start, the moment we start this project, the world will take notice and they will come to Bhutan to participate in developing these vehicles 
to participate in R&D and eventually to invest money here for the manufacture of electric vehicles. There's a lot of R&D that's required from the development of the battery. Like I said, all good electric vehicles run on laptop batteries. There's been no R&D for electric vehicles, batteries specifically for electric vehicles. It's just that the R&D for portable computer devices have taken off so much that that has benefited electric cars. Then there's R&D for motors, different types of motors and capacitors. And there's nothing that should stop us from making some of these components the supercapacitor or the motor, manufacturing them here, if not the entire car, manufacturing the motor or the battery and exporting them to the world. And finally, there's programming. That's where the brains come in. We have one, we have many programmers, but in this, in this area of electric vehicles, we have at least one programmer. The electric vehicles that he produces are indigenous programming. That's the most expensive part of the vehicle. And this has been domest uh, developed domestically. Now if he were to be assisted by three more programmers and they were to be assisted by three more programmers each, before you know it, we would have a critical mass of computer programmers who could be doing the world's best programming for computer vehicles, uh, for electric vehicles? And definitely the world's best programming for electric vehicles to ply on Bhutanese roads. Your suggestion about running cables from Punsling to Timpu all the way, I mean, that, why not? It could work. Those are how tram lines work. They could work, and we need to think about it. If this is the best option or there are other options. There's another technology that uses induction. So you put electrical cables, you, you embed electrical cables in the pavement, in the road, and the vehicle can drive over it. And the vehicle will be charged by a process of induction you have induction plates at the bottom of the vehicle that will pick up the electrical charge as you drive along and you charge your battery. And even that, you don't need it throughout the highway, only on specific places where you need to charge your vehicle. The induction plates in turn will charge the battery. So there's a lot of possibilities. But one possibility, since you raised it, one possibility we are looking at where I've requested someone to do a study is the possibility of having a rail link between Timpu and Funsling and Timpu and Paro. An electrical rail link. To, at least when we say it's not viable, at least we know that it's not viable. But we need to see how much it will cost. And on the other hand, if we know how many vehicles go up to Timpu carrying goods from here, from Funsling, so we can easily calculate the amount of fuel and the trucks depreciating and their maintenance costs. We can calculate all that and then see whether an electric train between Timpu and Funsling is viable or not. I don't know if that is viable, but if it is viable, look at the good fortune. We have beautiful scenery, cheap electricity, and good quality electricity. But of immediate, even more pressing uh, possibility, immediate possibility, is a rail link between Timpu and Paro. If we have an electric rail running between Timpu and Paro, you could get between Timpu and Paro in 20 minutes, in 30 minutes. And suddenly that opens up a whole new 
universe of possibilities between Timpu and Paro. I am going back to the theme. We can sit and do nothing about it and be led by change and have challenges in our hand, or we can do something about it and lead the change and enjoy more opportunities. There's a lady who put up her hand. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the wonderful and inspiring speech. I'm Nam Gyum from the College of Science and Technology, and I'm interested in the idea of electric cars. And my question is almost uh, similar to the one asked before. Um, if the cable car, sorry, if the electric car is to be introduced in Bhutan on a very large scale, I would like to know, uh, I would like to know if the electric cars are as fast as those which runs on diesel and petrol. I, rem I noticed Your Excellency mentioning it's fast, but does it run as fast as those Prados and Lancruces? And the next question is, how long does it take for an electric car to get uh, charged? Because if it takes a very long time, it might be very difficult to convince people to buy those cars. Thank you. How fast does this car look? Just this morning, I was chatting with Dr. Tashi Wangchuk, and I was asking him about uh, his car versus other cars and why he makes them so cheap. And he was telling me some secrets. Those will be his trade secrets. And those were the secrets that actually uh, interested the Carlos Ghosn, the CEO of Nissan Renault. Anyway, I was asking about Tesla, because I know Tesla runs fast. So I was asking him why it runs fast, and he was explaining things to me. It's very technical. You may understand it since you go to CST, but uh, we won't bore the rest, yeah? It travels very fast. It's designed to travel fast, and it is designed to be faster than the average car in its class. One of the reasons it has been designed to be fast is that in America, in their highways, they have to be able to merge into traffic and accelerate in very sh short times. That's why they are obsessed with zero to 60 kilometers or zero to 60 miles in a certain amount of seconds. I don't remember in how many seconds, but this car beats many other cars, most other cars. It's very fast. The reason I asked him about this car is because I was worried it could be too fast for Timbu. I'm very serious. This, the pickup in this car, the acceleration is so quick that if you're not careful, if you're not experienced, you could end up wrecking the car and yourself. So this, this car is fast. Now, I asked him about this car, his own car. He said he can make it fast. He'll have to install a bigger motor, and he'll have to reprogram his controller to be able to provide more power at the right time, and then quickly transfer that into more speed. And he said it's possible, but it will increase the cost of this car. About charging, this particular car went to well, he thinks it can go for about 150 to 200 kilometers on average. On average, because it depends on our terrain. Uh, also, because it depends on the temperature. Batteries, they lose, temperature, they lose power when it gets too cold. So it can run from 150 to 200 kilometers. He's already proven that it can go to Punaka and back on one charge. He's already proven that. He has 30 batteries in here. Like I said, each of those having laptop batteries. They take four hours to charge fully. So he charges them at night. He, puts, he has a charging station. Even that charger that he carries on his car 
in his car will determine the speed at which the batteries become fully charged. So he can use different chargers with different computer programs to allow the batteries to charge faster. It's all a matter of how much money you want to invest. The amount of money he invested for this car, it charges in four hours, and you can use your heater, the 16 amp heater plug. So at home, he uses the ordinary heater plug, heater points to charge his car. And he can do that in office too. Now what we need to do is if we make this into taxis, and if we expect 2,000, 3,000 of these taxis, we need to bring the cost down. And how we can bring the cost down is by reducing the number of batteries here so that they don't need to run 150 kilometers if they're going to stay in Timpu. 50 kilometers is enough. But in case while doing the 50 kilometers, if the battery is discharging fast, what, he, what we need to do is allow the taxi driver to go to a supercharger. You have a charging station which will charge the, all, all the batteries in five minutes. So those need to be strategically uh, built across the city. Not many, just a few. And those need, would need to be built. The superchargers would need to be built between Timpu and Paro, Timpu and Funsling, and between any other two cities that see high traffic or where we want to draw electric vehicle traffic. The one at the back, all the way at the back. I'm really happy to see students putting up their hands. Your Excellency, Tashos, distinguished guests and participants, a very good afternoon. My name is Yenten Jamso. Currently, I'm in fourth year uh, doing my degree in civil engineering in College of Science and Technology. Uh, I do believe that each and every individual will play an important role leading the change. But what if the change affects individual thought? Uh, my question is now, how do the government aim, aim to sustain the positive impact of leading the change in people's mind? Thank you. What will the government do to sustain the positive impact of leading the change? Uh, in people's mind. Well, we have to lead by example. Since our uh, human minds are so unpredictable, so I do believe that. Where? Our policies? Since our policies are unpredictable? Since what is unpredictable, Yuntin? Humans' minds are so unpredictable. So uh, I would like to know how do government aim to sustain the positive impact of uh, leading the change in people's mind? The, uh, the lady before you said, uh, can it be fast and can it be good as a Land Cruiser in Prado? Why do we, why, why do we Bhutanis, why are we so enamored by Land Cruisers? Why do we want Prado? Status symbol. It's because the rich, the powerful, we drive Land Cruisers in our hierarchical society. If our leaders were to drive these cars, or this car, the Nissan Leaf, but especially this car, this would become a status symbol. And as long as our leaders and our, well, leaders, our political leaders, our economic leaders, social leaders, drive electric cars, automatically the Bhutanese would want to aspire to drive electric cars and not fossil fuel cars. So there I am confident that we will not have a change of heart or a change of mind, the change of mind that you, uh, you are concerned about. Ultimately, the leaders must come together. As a leader, you, if you are convinced, if only if you are convinced, you should drive an electric vehicle. And you should stay with the electric vehicle. Obviously, if you are not convinced, then the dangers of you changing your mind is always there. And anyway, if all of us together, we are not convinced, we should not embark on such a project anyway to begin with. And 
someone in the front. Your Excellency, uh, I am Professor Dr. Ingle from Edu College of Business Studies. As teachers, we are habituated to ask questions to taste the knowledge and understanding of the person sitting opposite us. So I won't ask you questions, sir. I would only like to share some of my views. And I very sincerely wish that your dream of Bhutan as an electric car nation comes true, particularly because it is based on the strength of Bhutan. That is, the low, low distances as well as the electricity, which is very economically available. I would request you to also similarly explore the possibility of biodiesel. In India, the state of Chhattisgarh has proved that biodiesel is a very effective way of using fuel. And Dr. Raman Singh, who is the Prime Minister, uh, Chief Minister of Chhattisgarh, has been using this particular car bio, run on biodiesel for last five years. And as per my information, Chhattisgarh is a surplus electricity state in India. So I would request you to kindly explore the possibility of biodiesel, particularly with such a rich national re natural resources in Bhutan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. We've done a bit of initial research there already, both for biodiesel and for ethanol. And uh, both are possible. And it is a shame that we are not using ethanol to begin with immediately, because the Army Welfare product, uh, Project already distills spirit, ethanol, and exports to India the ethanol that it cannot use. All we need to do is expand the factory to add one more column in the distillation process to remove what little water molecules are still remaining. And you have ethanol that you can mix legally with petrol. Well, not legally at the moment in Bhutan because we don't have a law. But internationally, by international standards, you can mix 10% of ethanol in your petrol. And everything stays the same. Everything. So this is a good start that we could go into. The other is biodiesel. We have a lot of biomass. And yes, this is also a viable option. And I've already got some initial studies done, but not enough to actually take a calculated decision. Again, it goes back to what I was reporting earlier. If we want to lower our dependence on fossil fuel to the tune of 3.4 billion nilterms a year, how much money are we willing to invest? If we were to build another chukha, it would cost 20 billion. To earn, to save, to earn 3.4 billion, how much are we willing to invest? And that investment would go into things like ethanol and biodiesel, biofuels, in addition to electric vehicles. I am in favor of electricity because they are the least polluting for Bhutan and for the world, given how our electricity is generated. So I am in favor of electricity. Uh, but that said, we must do a proper feasibility study to ensure that we do not lose out on any of the opportunities. Thank you, Professor. Let's thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Pun So Wangdi. I'm a businessman based in Punsuning. At the same time, I'm also a BCCI uh, business representative of Chuka Zongkak. Uh, on behalf of all the business community here, I would like to first of all uh, take the opportunity to congratulate uh, Your Excellency and the cabinet members and the party members of People's Dem the Democratic Party for emerging as the, uh, the, uh, the winner of the second parliamentary election. Uh, we. Uh, on, uh, on behalf of all the, the business community, we wish and pray for the successful completion of your tenure. Uh, the, the, uh, drawing the concept from the, uh, the, your project from the electric uh, car project, 
Uh, it also reminds me of the very basic uh, the necessities which is uh, lacking behind. The, the experience up to now has been like more into kind of like infrastructure developments and then the big, big uh, mega projects. However, the, the very basic, uh, the, what is lacking behind is the very basic uh, commodities. Now, for example, like the, uh, if you take the example of yourself, like uh, for me, like right from my toe to up to the head, everything is totally like imported today. So what I would uh, emphasize is like to, import the subst to, to substitute the import. The first and the foremost, uh, the priority and emphasis should be given in the development of the small uh, cottage industries whereby people uh, develop uh, the, uh, the, uh, the products which are consumable within the country so that can be immediately like uh, the substituted. Thank you very much. Thank you for your suggestion. And uh, you haven't asked a question, right? You're making a suggestion. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, I can't agree with you anymore. Uh, cottage industries are extremely important. They will form the backbone of our economy. They will determine whether we as a kingdom we, are, we become economically reliant and we become economically successful or not. We are not doing enough. Today we have something like 7,000 odd cottage industry licenses, just 7,000. Of that, more than 3,500 are in Timpu alone. We are not using the potential that exists, the entrepreneurial potential that exists in Bhutan and the economic possibilities that exist. And I agree with you 100%. We cannot, we should not aim big without getting the fundamentals in place. And in, our, in any economy, you need the foundations that cottage industries, small industries provide for the economy. And this is an area we are focusing on. In fact, as far as... Uh, I am concerned, I, I've been headhunting for someone, anyone in the civil service who would take this with a passion, who would go and start developing cottage industries with a passion. We need to compile information, knowledge, ideas, train our people, uh, get them microfinancing, assist them, let them take off, monitor them, ensure that they pay back the loans in time, ensure that they grow. There's a lot of work to be done, and it can be done. We are going through a difficult time economically, but we do have enough resources, actually, for these very, very vital activities, extremely important activities. And uh, I take your suggestions, not just accept them, but I take it as encouragement to what we have already started. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, my name is S.K. Giri from Bhutan, Ferrolis Limited. Maybe it looks like I'm disturbing you, but I'm forced to disturb you because of today's such enlightening uh, discourse. La. I'm not going to the macro level, which Your Excellency has gone. La. I'm just getting back to the micro one only. La. Uh, first of all, just want to share something. When I saw that $2 billion house of Ambani, I was feeling really bad. But when I remembered back, one play which Father Mackey did with us in Sherapchi, The Mouse That Roars. You know, I, I felt a bit encouraging on that. And I also reflected back one of the articles in, 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 in one old paper saying that the population of Bhutan was equivalent to the beggars in Lucknow. So, you know, we are, we are you know, I was feeling that, you know, let me, let me, empathize, you know, let me encourage myself. And getting back to uh, my few, uh, couple of submissions. First one is on the 
FDI I don't know whether it's the right forum or not, but uh, a recent article in Quincell was quite thought-provoking. One of the partners in the FDI project has, is going to wind up, that's what the paper says. The reason was given that repatriation of dividend difficulties. So we all know that FDIs are encouraged in everywhere. We, are, we also already have few FDIs. And I don't know if there is a fate of few of the FDIs which will mature to the level of uh, getting dividend after some time. They shouldn't get shell shock. So I don't know whether this is a particular case for this FDI only or there are some other things. I, I beg that, uh, that uh, the, we may need to review the FDI rules so that Bhutan becomes a FDI destination. The other, the other one is that it is just, since I'm working in a private en enterprise, it doesn't mean that uh, it's just for me only. It's, uh, it's regarding the eligibility criteria of people, the citizens working in private institutions versus the government job requirements. If we see the government advertisements, some of them say that they accept any kind of employees, whether they are in the government or they are in the private. But there are also equally a big number of advertisements which say that they should be RCSE listed applicants only. So I was just wondering, of course, the RCSE people who, are, who have gone through the rigmarole of RCSE and then you know, got, elected, got uh, selected for the post are definitely cream de la cream. La. But my submission is that the employees who are in private sector also have undergone through a lot of, you know, 24-7 uh, jobs, you know, and then either you produce or perish this kind of exercises we all go through. La. So I'm sure if, if the government takes this kind of people also in the government role and is open for everybody. Of course, they are passing through uh, the eligibility criteria. I'm sure this, this kind of amalgamation, will, amalgamation of the uh, government uh, working machinery, as uh, your Excellency rightly said, that you need to revamp the system also. La. I'm sure they will add to be, you know, Druk Incorporate, something like if we run the government as a business house. So I was just, just my suggestion. La. And the third point is uh, something on the entrepreneurship. Uh, One of our... Uh, I, uh, I think... Uh, can, can we uh, cut you there? I think we yeah, are running sure. short of time and yeah, we'll yes, give yes, one last opportunity to someone else. Thank, thank you. you very much for your Thank question. you, thank you. Thank you. On the RCSC and private sector, I will not comment, okay? RCC chair, the commissioner, the chair, chairman of the RCC is standing, sitting right in front of me, and it would not be proper for me to uh, comment on this. I take your suggestion. FDI, we, many of us, are under the illusion that investors want to flock to Bhutan. They don't want to. They don't want to because for many reasons, but one of the reasons is what you mentioned. This is why one uh, company closed shop in Bhutan and left, G4S. Only simply because they couldn't repatriate something like 20,000 US dollars. How on earth do we expect foreigners to invest their hard-earned money in Bhutan? This must change. Before we while fooling ourselves that we are the darling of investors and everybody wants to come to Bhutan, and realizing that really nobody actually wants to come to Bhutan and those already in Bhutan are leaving, we should take corrective measures. So I agree with you. And I think our first step, all of us, has to be to understand that whether it's industries or schools or hotels or transport, construction, whatever, agriculture. It's not that investors are making a beeline to Bhutan. We have to understand that then only will we be ready to pull up our stockings and work harder. We need to work hard 
to earn their trust and confidence, to get their attention to begin with. Well, attention is not the problem, it seems like, in Bhutan. Everybody is interested in Bhutan. But we don't do anything about that attention. We need to capture that attention and convert that into meaningful investment. Otherwise, the population of Bhutan will indeed become like beggars of Lucknow. Okay, one last question. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for coming all the way from Thimpo to Pinsiling and sharing with us your noble vision. La. My name is Rinchen, and I'm one of the participants here in Rixla. Since I have had the opportunity to use uh, the electric vehicle manufactured by uh, Thunder Motor, I would like to share my experience. La. I think the first impression that I got is, uh, nonetheless, it's uh, uh, noiseless, uh, cheap, and environmental friendly. La. But uh, I think he was taking more than 12 hours time to get it charged to his full capacity. La. And then the, the first impression after that I got was, I think we need to focus more, give more time on R&D. Mm -hmm. And that the finishing was not also up to the mark. La. And uh, during the initial period, I think there were discussions that on, uh, Your Excellency has just uh, shown in the presentation that taxis will be given the opportunity. I think they have had a discussion. La, but, then, but then the main drawback was, the charging time and the finishing lab. So what I would like to suggest is, I think Thunder Motor, though it's indigenous, I think they should take time uh, before they fully launch to take more time on R&D lab. The second uh, one is more or less the question lab. Uh, in order to make it uh, accessible, cheap, uh, go is government looking at some sort of subsidy, lacrosse subsidy, so that I think uh, if, if the project is to make feasible, I'm sure we'll have to come up with some sort of strategy. Lab. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm, because I'm young, and maybe because I'm eager, I'm quite impulsive, but uh, I will resist from declaring any subsidies. Suffice it to say that if we get the support of the people, of the civil servants, of the armed forces, business community, if we get the support, then we should do something about taking electric vehicles to the next stage meaningfully, which would include subsidies. If we want actually taxi drivers to spearhead this movement, we need to give the first few ones subsidies. They are interested. In fact, he has a, Dr. Tashiwanchu has a backlog of inquiries. I can't call it orders, but inquiries. They are interested especially in the Maruti Swift model, because they can see what's happening in Timpu. Uh, I haven't driven the earlier Thunder Motor prototype, so, uh, I, 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 but I can accept your suggestions there. It's a matter of, I know, cost. How much do you want to bring down the cost by? So this particular model that he's using now, the Maruti Swift, has many more batteries 1,500 amp hours, ampere hours, and many more batteries, and yet it can charge in four hours. Why? Because he's installed a much more expensive charger, and his programming is a lot more robust. Yes, we need to do R&D, and we need to show that we are not, in our eagerness, the government does not uh, trip. The government does not subsidize something that's going to become wasteful. So I, your comments there, your suggestions there are extremely important. Last thing. So uh, I'd like to reiterate that I am deeply honored here to be here at the Friday Forum. And I accepted it with a lot of humility, accepted the invitation with a great deal of humility and also uh, with a lot of anxiousness. I, 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 I know that I am in the midst of people who are leaders in your own right, thinkers, scholars, and uh, very, very intelligent and driven students. Given that we are 
leaders, thinkers, scholars, accomplished businessmen and women, we need to take a concerted decision today to do what is right for our country. And to do what is right is to start by being concerned about what's happening around us. It's too easy to be misled by our own propaganda that Bhutan is a Shangri-La. It is a real country with real challenges, but also with real opportunities. We have the ability, whether it is entrepreneurs, scholars, leaders, we have the potential. It's up to us to realize that potential. It's okay for us to have a GDP of only 85 billion Yiltrums today. It's okay. But it's not okay if we don't grow. It will not be okay if imports overshadow exports. It will not be okay if our children don't find work. It will not be okay if our farmers cannot produce and the divide between the rich and the poor goes out of control. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in our hands. It is up to us, nobody else. We can lead the change, harvest opportunities, do our kings proud, and take our country forward. If we don't, if our economy stagnates or worse still deteriorates, if we pass on unserviceable amounts of debt to our future generations, if we don't even have money to purchase the goods and services that we need to, to import the goods and services that we need here, if we can't provide jobs for our students after spending 10, 12, 15, 18 years of hard work in their schools, if we can't provide them meaningful jobs, then we will have to accept. You and I will have to accept that we have left, let our country down. We are at a crossroads. We can lead by example. We can lead ourselves. We can take our country forward as never before. We can make our country even more secure. We can take our country in the path of economic self-reliance and social prosperity, but for that, we must work hard. They say nations are built on blood, sweat, and tears. We don't need to sacrifice blood. All that's required is for us to give our sweat. Everything else is in place. All that is required for us is to do our part, to work hard, to fulfill the mandate for which we are getting paid. And to fulfill the mandate, if you are students, for which you go to school for. But together, we can make Bhutan even more secure and more prosperous. Concurrently, if we don't do anything about it, if we are not willing to do our part, if we don't work hard, if we don't discharge our duties with a sense of concern, with a sense of urgency, with a sense of collective responsibility, then we will not have anyone else to blame. We, collectively, you and I, we will have to blame ourselves.
Thank you. Your Excellency, uh, the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Honorable Members of the RICS uh, Governing Board, uh, Dashos and distinguished guests, uh, RICS faculty members, and uh, participants of the first uh, Senior Executive Leadership Program, Chukha Zongkak and Finsling Dungkak uh, officials, representatives from the corporate and private sectors, ladies and gentlemen. RICS is the outcome of the noble vision of His Majesty the King, and yet, it is yet another invaluable gift from the Golden Throne to the people and the country of Bhutan. As a leadership development institute and as a think tank on governance, strategies, and policy, RICS will play a critical role in further promoting and upholding the long-term peace, stability, and progress of our country. It will also comprehensively supplement and complement the efforts of the royal government in developing human resource and framing sound national policies and strategies that will indeed transform challenges into opportunities, as His Excellency just highlighted. The Friday Forum Lectures at RICS are designed to be an integral part of our programs at, at the Institute, and we will continue to have many more eminent speakers in the subsequent weeks and beyond, both from within and outside the country. Apart from the courses that we run at the Institute, the Friday Forum Lectures, I believe, will be of great help in creating a community of intellects and well-informed citizens for our country in general and for Finsling and the nearby places in particular. On behalf of the Institute, its faculty and staff, participants of the inaugural Senior Executive Leadership Program, and on my own personal behalf, I would like to express our deep gratitude to Your Excellency for delivering this thought-provoking and inspiring inaugural Friday Forum Lecture at RICS, despite your very, very busy schedule. We are honored to have Your Excellency as the first eminent speaker of the RICS Friday Forum this is not only symbolically auspicious, but it reflects the tremendous support, goodwill, and importance Your Excellency and your government attach to this Royal Institute. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I would also like to thank the 23 course participants who have helped us in whatever way is possible to have this successful Friday Forum. I would like to thank colleagues at his Majesty's Secretariat in Thimpu, Chukha Zongkak and Finsling Zongkak officials, Finsling Tromde, RBP, RBA, Haki and Druk Hotels, and all other agencies in Finsling who have helped us organize this event. Thanks are certainly due to my staff uh, here at RICS who have worked hard to put up this show today. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the guests and distinguished participants for joining us today, and we do look forward to having you here in the future Friday Forum Lectures. Thank you very much. <clears throat>